What is going on everybody? This is Alex Fregnani and I welcome you to another episode of the Foresight Chats series. In this episode of the series, I had the pleasure to talk with one of the leading strategic management professors globally and also the first author of a recent and really insightful book titled Why Managers Matter, The Perils of the Bossless Company. Today, I'm talking with Nikolai J. Voss. Nikolai J. Voss is a professor of strategy at the Copenhagen Business School. He is a prolific contributor to the research literature in management and also one of the world's most cited management scholars. Most of my conversation with Nikolai is about his recent book, together with Peter Klein. The book offers a somehow refreshing and evidence-based pushback to an idea that has been in vogue for quite a while by now, both among futurists and among management gurus from Alvin Toffler and Ken Wilber to Fred Laloux and Gary Hamill. And that idea is that corporate organizations are getting and should be getting flatter and flatter, with little or no hierarchy and authority at all. But this conversation is also about Nikolai's work on wokeness in organizations, on Nikolai's views about the biggest problems in management research, and also on his experience as a business school professor in Bocconi, in Italy. So, I hope you will enjoy the conversation. Nikolai, thanks so much for joining me today. Well, thanks for the invitation, Alex. I I truly appreciate it. Great. So, I really wanted to talk to you. You are a seasoned strategy scholar with a number of topics of expertise. And more recently, you have worked on rather controversial topics such as hierarchy, wokeness, and capitalism, unlike most researchers in management and strategy. So we can really have a talk about some interesting stuff. So why don't we start with your recent book with Klein? You wrote a super interesting book called Why Managers Matter, The Perils of the Bossless Company. And by the way, I want to point out to the cover because it's very interesting and evocative. It shows a group of cyclists literally cycling into a pit. So for those of you, I'm talking to the audience right now who are watching this on YouTube, I'm gonna paste the cover here on the screen. Now, this book is quite of a manifesto that warns us against ideological positions when it comes to dismantling hierarchies in organizations, which is rather timely today. So. Why don't we start from there? Can you give us a very short uh, intro about this book before we talk about management issues more broadly? Yes, I, I can. And many, many thanks for the kind words uh, about the book. Uh, so it, again, it's called um, Why Managers Matter, The Periods of the Bossless Company. And I, I think in a nutshell, it's basically a rehabilitation of the notion of managerial authority and therefore also the notion of 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 hierarchy and a critique, as you indicated, of what Peter Klein and I call the, the Boston's company narrative. Uh, and what's that? Well, it's, it's fundamentally, it's, uh, it's a set of claims about the ideal way of organizing. And it, it really does involve uh, once a one size fit all kind of, kind, kind of idea. Namely that, you know, Boston's having no hierarchy is really, if you think about it, it is for all companies. Uh, and all managers, therefore, should think about it, should think seriously about it. But if you if you examine the narrative, there, there are really so many problems. And I, I, I almost don't know where to start. But, well, we, we can start with the evidence that is, you know, presented in favor of the Boston's company narrative. Um, and, and, and a basic problem is it's, it isn't really supported by, by evidence or by good evidence. There are various stories, examples, but they are usually cherry-picked. 
And even if you look at, even if or when you look uh, into those cherry picked examples, it, it turns out that there's no bosslessness going on per se. And it shouldn't really be surprising to anyone with a social science background, because what, do, I mean, what does sociology, anthropology, and so on tell, tell us? These fields tell us that in any group, a leader or a boss, or someone taking, taking charge will, will emerge, right? There's even, there's even a, a law for that, you know, the, the iron law of oligarchy. And so if you look at these cherry-picked examples like Valve or Morningstar or what, what have you, uh, that, that, that will be in Valve, there'll be a Gabe Newell. In Oticon, there'll be a last call in, in, in Morningstar, there'll be a Chris Rufa and so on, right? So so they're really they're really at our bosses, always living. Right. There is some evidence around, solid evidence, serious evidence that speak to some of the things that the bossless company is taken up with. So for example, there's evidence gained by, by Julie Wolf of the Howard Business School and her various co-authors and, and colleagues which shows that among the, the big US corporations, the hierarchy has indeed been flattening. So de-layering mm. has been going on probably for, for quite some time. But if you look into what she, how she interprets her empirics, her evidence, it's not about bosslessness. It's quite the contrary. It's about getting typically top managers closer to the real action. Okay. So it's, it's, it's actually the opposite if you think about it, right? It, it may involve de-layering, may initially counted to, to it typically, but not surprisingly when you think about it, it may involve more management, right? So again, it's not about bosslessness. I think what, what people mean when they, when they say the bossless company, and I, only today there was another article in Financial Times about this, right? Yeah. Uh, so it, it, it's a very popular narrative. Uh, and, and not at all underground, as that article kind of kind of hinted. But what what they mean is that bosslessness is when the hierarchy is very flat, uh, so almost totally delayered hierarchy. Virtually all decision making power has been delegated. Employees are more or less free to create their own tasks. Uh, rewards are peer based. A lot of coordination is kept together by means of information uh, and uh, communication technology there's, there's constant information sharing and communication and so on. I, I guess this this kind of this nails it probably uh, and sometimes I'm not sure we, we can return to this but sometimes this may work but the, the point in, in my book with Peter simply is that thus characterized it fits a small subset of companies. Mm -hmm. it, it certainly doesn't fit your average industrial corporation, for example. So it, it just isn't uh, a universal organizational model. And therefore, right. it's potentially misleading, right? Let, let me give you an example of how it can be badly misleading. So there's, a, there's an example, a funny example, in, a, in an article in the Harvard Business Review by, by Gary Hamill was one of the, the main proponents of, of the Boston's company narrative, uh, together with uh, Michael Samini. And they, they tried to estimate the economic loss for the US economy of excessive management. In order to be able to uh, estimate such a loss, you need to have a, an idea of what, what, what is excess or excessive management. And what they do is they look at the, the manager to employee ratio in the typical US corporation. And then they also look at the manager to employee ratio in bossless companies like Valve and Morningstar and so on, right? So in one case, it's one to five, the other case, it's one to 10, I, I think the numbers are, right? And then they say, suppose all companies had the manager to employee ratio of say Morningstar or Valve, right? How much could we save? And it's it's obvious we could we could just fire a lot of those middle managers or top managers, right? And they calculate an absurdly high number. I think it's like fifteen percent of of overall US GNP, which can which is according to them it's pure it's pure waste basically, right? Because you have all these managers running around in the workplace and they don't do anything. But you can easily see this this you just cannot do this because it presupposes that the uh, the the morning style well model, the bossless company model, right? It it fits any company. It's a fascinating example. Well, I can think of a third order consequence of this. If you 
if you fire all those people, the economy will have a huge unemployment all of a sudden, right? <laughs> Absolutely, of course, of course. Thinking about how the loop comes back, and that probably is not going to be a gain for the economy as a whole. Right. It's going to trigger a crisis. So one interesting thing about this is that it seems that when the bossless company is put forward, what it is meant is not really without bosses, but it is a different kind of bosses because there's something you point out in the book, and that is there are two kinds of hierarchies or task assignment, which is one is Mark one and the other is Mark two, right? I think this is a very aligned with what you just said. Mark one is uh, basically command and control and micromanagement and overseeing every specific task that employee the employee is into. And Mark two is more like setting up goals and then leaving the competence of the employee just uh, carte blanche, so to speak, right? And it seems that the critiques of the bossless company are criticizing a hierarchy as a whole, but in reality, what they want is more of the Mark II authority rather than the Mark I, right? This is quite interesting because they conflate the two in this macro problem, uh, but in reality, hierarchy is changing, it's not going away. Am I correct? You are completely correct. I mean, if, if the bossless company narrative had been presented in this way, I mean, we wouldn't have written, we wouldn't have written the book, right? Right, right. Uh, and I suppose... If you want to be kind to the Boston's company narrative, mm. it could be read as asking, what kind of management is it that we need? What emerging trends and issues should be focused in, in management? That's basically the point. Absolutely. And, and you know, if, 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 if Gary Hamels uh, and, 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 and so on, the other proponents of this narrative, if, if their main problem is with, you know, the kind of overbearing, micromanaging, middle manager, no, no problem. But I mean, that's what, what everyone is saying, isn't it? Right, right. And it, the problem is that it becomes, it becomes, you know, totally general. It's like management in general isn't needed. Yeah. And that just, that just ain't right. I mean, look, look at what, what happened quite recently. Let me do the pandemic. We went through a, a nasty, more or less unforeseen thing. And we can talk more about uncertainty later, right? But it's, it's clear that the, uh, the uh, disturbance was massive and affected all aspects of organizations and affected all, acti all activities and therefore, you know, coordinated action had to be taken by someone who had the, you know, an overview, uh, was able to employ a wide lens on what goes on in our organization, in our company, and was able to, you know, interpret, frame, sense-make, and plan and you know issue, issue some instructions rough overall instructions perhaps on, on the basis of this diagnosis of, of what is happening and this is something that it, again conceptually this this kind of these kind of processes can be organized so that they are completely horizontal mm -hmm. so you could imagine some kind of you know employee gathering so all 1000 is pitch in what with with their idea about what what's going on and how should we react and so on. Uh, so it's it's conceivable, it's possible, but it's just highly inefficient. Yeah, we're not saying the Boston's company cannot work per se; it can work. If we think about what organizations have to do, they have to you know figure out what 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 is the division of labor that we want. So who should do what? When should they do it? And what, what, what quantities of the, the timing and scheduling and division of labor and roles to determine and, and allocate and so on. And then we need that to sort of fit together. So the issues of structure and the issues of control. And in principle, all organizational you know, setups that are forms of hierarchy that we can think of, that they can do it. The, the problem is, what is the level of efficiency at which they are doing it? Okay, this, this sounds subtle, right? But we, we go through implicitly this exercise in the, in the book and we say, yeah, it, we, we can imagine a world in which the boss company can do it all, but it'll be cumbersome, it will be slow, it will be fraught with all sorts of, of costs, right? So therefore, most of the time, doing it the 
kind of the old fashioned way with the manager and a, and a chain of command and a line of reporting and a hierarchy and so on and relatively well established rules that usually work. 100%. You know, what you just said really spoke to me because, as you know, I've been living in Asia for a long time. And uh, if you actually look at how Chinese companies, Taiwanese companies, Japanese companies work, the hierarchy is very strong. But there is also a reason why that hierarchy is so strong, because the culture demands and expects for that kind of hierarchy. So I, I have witnessed firsthand, literally, when I was a consultant in Shanghai, in China, for example, I have witnessed uh, Italian expats trying to implement uh, less uh, strict hierarchies in the Chinese environment where the power distance is very high, right? And of uh -huh. course you could do that, right? As you just said, you could do that, but it will take an enormous amount of time to arrive at the decision, right? The whole room of uh, local employees would just look at each other, blank state, right? What are we doing now? Yeah. They're not giving us order. So this is super interesting what you're saying because you're, you're talking about Italian expats and Italy is actually, if I remember correctly, and this is certainly what I experienced myself when I worked in Italy, this is another society which is relatively high in power distance. But not as much as China. So even, even there, there's a difference, right? That's fascinating. Yeah. You know, the psychological aspects of this. Um, so there's a, a commentary on, on our book by, by Libby Weber of the University of California. Yeah, Weber, Omar. that's right. And one of the things she says is, yeah, um, that... She's a psychologist by, by training. And she says, one of the big problems with the Boston's company narrative is that it's going to induce a lot of psychological costs mm -hmm. of, of the kind that you just talked about, right? Yeah. I mean, this is not how we've been doing it. This is not aligned with our national culture and the, 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 the company culture that, we are, that we're used to and so on. It's just hard to, to reframe and reorient and... Uh, this is going to create all sorts of frictions in exchanges between employees, right? Right. So I, I don't want to make it so black and white. Let's let's also like give the devil its due, so to speak. Absolutely. What are those circumstances? In which circumstances does the bossless company actually work or might work? Yeah. This is asking about the circumstances under which you know uh, an old an organization can solve the, the coordination and the cooperation problems faces through bossless organizing, mm. through minimal hierarchy, through a lot of delegation, mm. uh, through a very flat hierarchical structure. Uh, and yes, as I, as, I, as I said initially, it may work for some companies, probably a small minority so far at least. And one simple thing is that, you know, most most bossless companies that we that we observe are, uh, are relatively small. Okay. Even even Morningstar, which is after all one of the leading tomato producers in the world, it's it's a relatively small company. I think it has a couple of thousand permanent employees, and then of course it has temporary employees when during the season. You know, Valve is I don't know what, what Valve is now like nine hundred employees, and, but typically these companies are small companies, 40, 50, okay. 60. Although I have to say there are few. There are a few counter examples, uh, such as Sports Orc. I'm not sure you, um, no. you or your listeners have, know about this, but this is basically a, a company in healthcare in the Netherlands, which has really created a big splash because it's it's fundamentally based on on, on, on nursing, and the the way it runs, it's it's based on self-organizing teams. I, mean, I think six seven uh, persons. Uh, self-organizing teams of nurses. Okay. So they they define the tasks and they execute the tasks within the team, and there's very very little hierarchical structure. I, I think there's a management layer, some you know some basic back office uh, functions also. But it this, and it has it started out as an entrepreneurial startup with six or seven nurses about ten years ago, mm. and now it uh, Word Talk has more than ten thousand wow. employees. Nurses, so it, it really is big, and apparently, it has transformed healthcare in the in the, in the Netherlands in in a, in a very positive way because these self-organizing teams are very very adaptive, and they are capable of of saving a lot of, of costs. But but notice, I mean, we, we're talking about an industry where it's it's pretty well understood what what you have to do, right? Yeah. Yes. Uh, yes. And these uh, people. 
uh, the employees, they basically have the same education. They may have been educated at the same nursing school. They have a protocol, right? Exactly. And so in a sense, there's a lot of structure because of their shared background and their, their education and because the task environment is pretty clear and, and transparent. They know what they should do and basically also how they should do it, right? So when, when that's the case, bosses, I guess, can work. But then, there's, then there are also companies like Morningstar, which is also very, very interesting to observe because this, this, is, a, so this is an industrial company. They harvest tomato and they turn tomatoes right. into pulp, or whatever. Probably sell a lot of it to Italy, right? Yep. They're based in California. And, you know, they have, they have a very linear traditional technology, of course. But again, you could say this, again, it's a traditional technology. So the structure that assists bosslessness in this case comes from people basically understanding what goes on. It's, these tasks are simple. Plus, you have a founder, Chris Rufer. I think he started Morningstar back in 69, 68. And in some ways, it was very much a, a product of the, uh, the, you know, the, the counterculture of that time. Mm. Then some of the, let's say, the more libertarian aspects of the hippie culture, right? Freedom, autonomy, uh, self-actualization, uh, um, re realizing yourself, empowerment, and so on, down with authority, all that, right? And politically, Ru Rufa actually is a libertarian. And he's just thinking, if, if, the, if we believe in these libertarian principles on the political domain, why, why not take them mm -hmm. into the company? Of course. And that's, in a sense, that's what he has been doing with, with, uh, with Morningstar. And he's been pushing and he's been, you know, this... He's been promoting these libertarian principles over five decades and refining them and, uh, you know, essentially bringing market-like ways of organizing into Morningstar in a very clever way with a set of, you know, contracts where employees make contracts with, with, with those employees that they, they work the most with and they set goals for each other and monitor each other. And it's just very, very clever. And I'm, I'm really impressed by this company. So even, even for, for a traditional, not a particular, not very huge, but a traditional industrial company like Morningstar, Boston's can perhaps work if sufficient effort is put into it. I guess he's also, he's also, he will also be looking for, you know, really special employees, people who believe in these principles. Indeed, indeed. We're not saying in the book that Boston never works. It, it may, but the circumstances are really special. You did your job as you should. You were aware of the nuances, right? The moderators in a very scientific jargon, so to speak. There are indeed uh, cases where it works. And it is impressive that maybe in those specific circumstances, it, it can be recreated, right? But it's also super fascinating that it seems that these circumstances are uh, environments where the business environment has a fair degree of certainty, is not changing dramatically. And I love that in the book, you make it very clear that in environments where there is high turbulence, right, or high, un high uncertainty, then the bossless company narrative is much less likely to work. And I can say this as well from a scenario planning specialist that, uh, you know, there, there, is, there is a misunderstanding there because when you, when you look at a company that is in a very high turbulent environment, and you look at how some of the, the decisions uh, should be decentralized, which is in fact the case, then you might conclude that all the strategic decision-making should be decentralized, right? So there is a bit of a nuance there, but as, as you right. said in the book, actually the quick choices of the top management in those turbulent environments are central. Although at the lower level, some smaller tasks could be decentralized, the strategic decision-making still should in high turbulence environment come from the top, right? Yeah, absolutely. And of course, the, the main challenge is deciding on the proper scope of decentralization or delegation, if right. you like. And, and in a sense, this is almost the classical management challenge, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, figuring out how, how much delegation and, you know, e even deciding on a, on a bossless or way of organizing, that's... Someone does it, right? Yeah, there is a hierarchy involved. <laughs> exactly. In a sense, it's a hierarchical action. But this is super interesting because when you have these turbulent environments, you, you have this paradoxical combination of you know, decisive top management 
intervention. Ah, oh, that's interesting, yes. Often coupled with widespread delegation at lower levels. Yeah, and that is perhaps what makes a lot of people argue we should implement decentralization for everything, but it's not the case. Absolutely. I think you're right. Yeah. 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 So I am very curious about the deeper epistemological forces behind this argument because this is something that in the book it transpires a bit but we certainly can talk about it right so there is a lot of talk more recently about changing capitalism into another economic system that is more responsible now this talk comes in very different sources it comes under the moniker of stakeholder capitalism it comes under the moniker of socialism, by which sometimes it's just meant a more responsible form of capitalism. But the whole idea is that we have a new wave of values that are emerging, and among them probably dignity of work, uh, autonomy, and all this uh, you know, decrease in oppression, so to speak, are certainly front and center, right? So I guess the whole epistemological drive behind the the bossless company is you can attribute that to this political and epistemological change of values so to speak right and in a way in a way your book is saying yeah wait the the values are changing but let's not make a mess out of it right so i'm curious about how you read the more deeper structure right of the because there is a political aspect so to speak i mean th- this is a book that has a political uh, critique in a way yeah, I'm not sure it's, it's uh, that strong in the book, but it, it's true that we have at least one chapter that deals with sort of the origins of, of the Boston's company narrative. And, and one of those um, origins may, may be, you know, thinking on worker cooperatives and very, very early socialism. So so, right. socialism in itself is, you know, as, as you already indicated, it's very heterogeneous, of course, right? So you have sort of a more libertarian a freedom-oriented part of socialism, which is about worker cooperatives and, you know, dignity of work. You use that that, um, yeah. that expression and, you know, the, the autonomy of, 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 of the, the working person and, and, and so on. Yeah, and I, I, I do think that some parts of the Boston's company narrative goes back to that, particularly the part that, is, that talks about democracy in the workplace. But that's also part of it. And uh, then, of course, there's a lot... So this is like... 200 years back, right? So it right. begins with, you know, the, the so-called, Marx called them the utopian socialists, yeah. right? And and of course, they had practical ramifications because they also tried to set up these bosses, communes, and we know how that ended. They all they yeah. all collapsed and they very quickly established very harsh bosses, by the way, right? So, it, <laughs> so and this is one of the problems with this narrative that it, it easily becomes like the schoolyard. Yeah. Or if you look at, at Glassdoor and, and look at what some people or some former employees say of companies like Valve, you know, it, it was basically like high school, right? Mm. With with uh, with cliques and bullies and factions. And the point is, if you don't have formal power in the form of a hierarchy, again, someone is going to informally grab the power. Yeah, power is going to come back. It's basically animal farm, right, at the end of the day. It is, Exactly. So you you have to think about that also when you think when, when you when you proclaim that hierarchy is bad and managerial authority is bad and perhaps it may be to some extent bad but the perhaps the alternative is actually much worse right yeah yeah but then we also look at the uh, I, we we discussed that a little bit earlier at the um the, what, what went on particularly in California because what went on there culturally was super important I think for this narrative you know it was all about uh, liberation and empowerment and not and perhaps not so much about dignity of work. I'm, I'm not sure, but and that you know, you can it's difficult to put a political label on that because that's something. These are values that, say, a modern day political libertarian will applaud. And at the same time, many of, of the young people today who talk about socialism often not knowing what they're talking about, right? They'll also talk about uh, cherish these values, right? And that just goes to show how very strongly held these values are in our contemporary culture. So the, one of the reasons why you see these all these articles popping up in the newspapers and magazines all the time about busters companies, yeah. I mean, there's, there isn't a week where we don't have one. It's of the zeitgeist. 
It's a zeitgeist, exactly. Yeah, it, it very much is because we all like these. We all, we all, we're sitting there, perhaps in our very jobs, and there's a, there's this man, micromanaging uh, manager, right? And it's super annoying, and we want to be free and <laughs> be autonomous yeah. individuals who are in charge of our own destiny and so on, right? Yeah, it speaks of something that is uh, deeply needed. I mean, current times, somebody who does command and control every single task, especially for very knowledge intensive work, it's probably an excessive uh, expenditure of money. So it does speak of something that is needed. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. So, so this is another thing we haven't really talked about. Mm. The, uh, the Buster's company, again, does tap into some, you know, not just cultural values, but also simpler things like, you know, the need for flexibility, for example. Yeah. In your work, the flexible workplace and things like that. And if you can, if you can decide on your work, and if you can basically manage yourself, the implication that some may draw from this is that then you also have a lot of freedom and you have a lot of flexibility. And we know from from, from studies and economics that people place a huge value on simply yes. having flexibility. Indeed, that's job crafting, right? I mean, much less likely to turn over to another company with that. Yeah. yeah, you know, I agree with you that the book doesn't deliberately talk about these things. It's almost like w- between the lines, but perhaps it is my proclivity to uh, fathom what are the epistemological lenses used by the author, right? So I like I like to see where where these epistemological clashes occur, which, which is what I've, so, I've seen in the book, right? So I can think about all this bossless company, when it goes to the extreme, right? Uh, under the umbrella term of a postmodern value system. And uh, your book your book is a critique to that. So in a way is bringing postmodern back to modernity. So back to the modern style of management, which is, is going back. But in another way, which is the interesting part, and that's why I find, found the book so interesting. I think the book is also telling, let's go beyond this postmodern proposition of the bossless company and look at science and look at whether it's actually working or not. So let's be more sophisticated. Let's look at the nuances, right? So let's keep right. it when it's good and not keep it when it's bad, which, which is nice because the, to me, as a, somebody who looks at epistemologists, it speaks of what is the next merging between the various clashes we have into uh, a scholarship that is inclusive of all the various ideological claims and so forth, less biased and ideological. I, I hope it doesn't sound so esoteric. I might have been a bit esoteric in what I just said, but I don't know if it makes sense. This is, this is very interesting. The Buster's company narrative has uh, adopted this, you know, basically you can say anything you want to almost, right? And if anything goes epistemology to use by arms terminology, right? Indeed. Uh, so, and that's I guess this is why you call it postmodernist. This is this is very interesting. I hadn't thought of it in this way, but I do agree with you that we're probably becoming a little bit too loops, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, in, in management discourse in general, and it, it's really interesting because on the one hand you have this big push in huge parts of management, like strategy in particular, for stronger empirics, stronger evidence. Uh, and on the other hand, you have a, you seem to have sometimes, I'm not, perhaps I'm overly generalizing, but you seem to have newspapers and magazines that will, will print anything and everything, right? As, absolutely opinion based, right? Absolutely. And it's opinion based. That's a good point. I'm glad that I made you think of the epistemological lenses behind. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you certainly did. And, but you know, that's seeping into management practice in, in some other ways because we, Peter and I wrote an article. It's called why why do companies go woke oh well, that's a super interesting article yes yes it's... okay you've seen it and it, it makes similar points you know um why, why do we see these woke values suddenly coming in based on problematic evidence most of the time right and uh, i mean we, we don't actually don't take a stand on whether these values are, are, are bad or, or or the opposite or good oh, in, in that article we I simply ask why why is it that companies seem to embrace these woke values when it seems that the CEOs don't really generally support them, the, the owners don't really support them, many employees don't like them. And we so the story we tell is that it's probably driven to a large 
extent by middle managers. You know, this this is typically how you know social movements, particularly in the US, but probably everywhere, have been insinuating themselves into companies, named by middle managers, HR people, and so on, adapting these these ideas uh, and sometimes taking them beyond what legislators and others actually intended. Uh, and I'm not saying all this is bad. It's, it's not. There's probably many good things that have happened over the many decades of, you know, this kind of social change. But, you know, I think we may have seen things going a little bit far with, with the woke company, right? It makes so much sense because most most likely the top management is not time for wokeness. Most uh, likely the newcomers don't dare for wokeness, right? Don't dare to put their their interest in it. But the middle managers, okay, that's where people need perhaps to legitimize their job. They need to be more secure. They need to increase their influence. So that's why they promote so much wokeness. So that's, that article has, has resonated with me a lot. That's exactly the story we're telling the article. So you're summarizing it very, very accurately. But a lot of people really didn't like that message at all. We received quite a deal of, let's say, flack on, on Twitter, for example. Okay, I'm interested because we we were going to talk about this anyway, so we can segue okay. nicely into this, right? Uh, I am very curious about the response in general uh, to the book. And also, uh, let's include this article as well, because what I've seen, right, what I've seen is that there is a very interesting set of commentaries on the Journal of Organizational Design. Am I correct? Yes, that's correct. Yes. Okay. And you and Klein also wrote a very insightful rejoinder. And my view of the whole set of commentaries was there wasn't such a very inflammatory debate going on, right? There was a critique about gender roles, which was not exactly on point. And uh, there were very good points, but generally there wasn't such a huge debate. Uh, so I'm very curious whether this is the case on media as well, such as you mentioned Twitter and what is the response? Because it really speaks of what is the response of management scholarship with the society at large? Right. You raise a bunch of connected issues here. You're, you're right. The, the commentaries and the in the general organization design were basically all positive. But, you know, it, it's an excellent book. So how, how could they not? <laughs> uh, and you also write uh, one of the commentaries, uh, maybe the one by Libby, where I raised the issue of, 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 of gender. But I, I honestly, I think that was it's based on this reading of, of the book. But the first part of the book is polemical. So we, we, we attack with abandon the Boston's company narrative. But by being so polemical, it's quite clear that we, we stepped on some people's toes. Yeah. And some people got upset. That's very clear. So you, uh, you may have seen um, a video by a, a Spanish, I think it's a consultant. The person sells this kind of stuff, the Boston's company narrative. So, you know, we, we're attacking the way he, he makes money, right? And... Uh, there are also some, if you look at the Amazon stars, there are some, some, um, some people have given it the, the minimum score without any comment. And, you know, there was also one, one hostile review in a, in a, in a sort of practice in a journal, also by a consultant who, who sells okay. this kind of bustless stuff. But, but really most of, I think most of the sort of more academic commentary has been very, very positive. And the businessmen, the practicing businessmen who have had time to read the, the book tells us that, you know, this is, this is very needed. And I, I, hear, I hear this all the time. And, both, and I, I've been puzzling about why, why my, my, my guys, my, my middle managers, why they would listen to, to people telling them that they're superfluous, right? <laughs> which, which is a paradox. Well, it seems, that, it seems that there are two things here going on. One thing is that perhaps because most of the respondents were from business schools, which yeah. tend to, you know, by, by and large, study companies with hierarchies, right? So it's very difficult to see opinions that differ greatly to what has been argued in the book. So that's one thing, right? In my own field, as you know, I've written articles against foresight major point of views and criticizing why they're wrong. And there were clashes that border the insults right so interesting to see that perhaps this is driven that i mean the lack of very inflammatory responses is driven by the kind of scholarship right and on the other hand there's another thing going on which is on the media then it's much more inflammatory because people have freedom but the interesting stuff is why don't business scholars talk more about these themes because i am very comfortable talking with you about themes such as this which are, even if the, the political part is not deliberate in your book, 
that are indeed yeah. tapping into political issues, right? So I'm very comfortable talking with you because you are a res- you are a senior scholar with uh, uh, hundreds, I think, is it hundreds or a large number of publication, right? Very established. So you are comfortable talking about these themes, but. What does it say that we don't talk about these themes in business schools? We, there is very little scholarship on wokeness, capitalism, and uh, whether the hierarchies are, are are right or not. Right? What What is your opinion on this? I'm I'm feeling comfortable talking with you about this because if I ask this a colleague a, as an assistant professor, he would probably not answer. Right? Honestly, I think it's very very simple. The most conformist people almost in the world are academics. And this may sound counterintuitive because, you know, science is about, you know, bold conjectures and challenging others and uh, continuous discussion and critique, right? That's that's our ideal. That's ideal. Actually, and of course, there is scientific discussion, but in many, many ways, academics are really, really, really conformist. And in particular, they are conformist when it comes to, to values and, and politics. And I mean, there are, there's, there are there's dozens of studies that demonstrate this. So it, it differs across the various disciplines. I think anthropologists in US, they are probably, they're they uniformly mm-hmm. left-wing or, or, yeah. or liberal, right? Le- probably left liberal. I don't recall the article where, where and when it was published, but I think the author didn't manage to find any single professor in anthropology who identified as a Republican, <laughs> right? And then you have sociology, it's almost the same. And people, it's funny because people in sociology, they like to think of, say, economics as, as very right-wing and, you know, uh, yeah. super free market and, and all that, but it, it's not. I mean, economics is also fairly left-wing uh, in terms of the conventional political right. spectrum, they really are. I mean, uh, even I think even in engineering, I think the, there's a left wing bias, and uh, this really it is. A, of course, it's a huge problem. The very sensible people who are centrists, like Jonathan Haidt and so on, yeah, uh, have said these things for a long time, and we we are stifling dialogue. And yeah, it's great what they're doing with the Heterodox Academy. Actually, it is. It is. It's really great, and also great that they've been able to, you know. You know, connect with people who wouldn't necessarily classify themselves as conservative or Republican or right wing or whatever, right? But just you know, sensible centrists. So sensible, that's, yeah. So, yeah, that's that's very good. Of course, it is. Uh, but with, I'm not sure we should. But there's a danger of closing the or making the the overtime window in academia too too narrow, right? Yeah, indeed, indeed. In, in principle, you could argue if you're really an absolutist that nothing is off limits in science. When Peter and I put forward what we truly believe is an objective argument about why companies go woke, right? Uh, we get attacked and in all sorts of ways, even for using the word woke, uh, because that in itself apparently is I know. right-wing moniker, although many woke people use it proudly themselves, right? You talked about the uh, if, if you were talking to an assistant professor, that person wouldn't say the same thing, right? That's what I think. I personally, I've never been afraid of speaking my mind. And, you know, some people may say this is my my privilege because, you know, white, male, Northern European in a country where you, where you actually can't speak your mind uh, and so on. Yeah, and that may be, but I also think that's a little bit too much fear among younger people to actually speak up and speak out. It, it's totally legit to speak up and out if it's for progressive, in favor of progressive causes, right? That, that only gives you a point, but... Um, the uh, the belief is that if you say something that is perhaps a critique of some of those progressive causes, then you'll be uh, cancelled and so on. I, I think that's probably a misunderstanding, certainly in Europe. So uh, the US is admittedly quite different. And certainly in business schools, much less likely to happen in business schools. Yes. But there's, I, generally, I find there's more... There's, a great deal more freedom of speech in business schools than in uh, yeah. some of the and more pragmatic. Sort of they have, I think, the the business school business school faculties are forced to grapple with really day to day issues with organizations, even if their scholarship sometimes can be uh, a, a bit highly highbrow and uh, high falutin, but they still have to respond to organizations, real world organizations. So. Uh, perhaps in other disciplines that that might not be the case in the social sciences, right? So economics and business schools, uh, they have their feet uh, steadily on the ground on this. Yeah, I think that's right. I think that's right. 
Nikolai, I have another question that uh, I am comfortable asking you, but perhaps not an assistant professor. And that would be, what do you think are the biggest problem in uh, business schools in general? So in management and strategy as a field of scholarship? Uh, another big, big question, but also a very good one. Uh, I, I, there are many, many problems. So if we, if we look at the theory side, we, we have, as, as you know, because you've been there, we have this demand requirement. You, you must always produce new theory. And uh, that, that, there's one journal, one journal in management that is dedicated ostensibly to uh, replication work and reporting facts and so on. And this is the Academy of Management Discoveries. Virtually all other journals require a novel theoretical contribution. And it, it it probably is crazy, and we need to uh, we need to remove that requirement somehow because a lot of management, many many management fields seem to me to be close, be already saturated, or being close to being saturated. So think about something like international business. I don't know how familiar you are with that um, with that field, but you know I I see almost now I'm upsetting all my international business colleagues, but well, they can, they can they can cope with it. Um, I don't see much novelty there, uh, mm. and I, perhaps there is a need for much novelty because I mean, in a sense, all substantial stuff has been set basically, yeah. uh, and perhaps you know, perhaps is strategy in the same situation. The the major innovations probably have been made, but sometimes you know the the attempt to make a novel theoretical contribution is strained. It really is. So the way church strategy is probably changing is it's becoming stronger in, in the way it packages its thinking. So that's it becomes more mathematical, more formal perhaps, which is a good thing, I think, overall. But you know, this 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 requirement that we must all do new theory in everything we write it doesn't work because what, what happens? People jump on bandwagons so you know, imagine here's here's the here's the the median management scholar not really having an idea, yeah, a, a new theoretical idea. But then suddenly, right. suddenly someone comes along and says, "He has to, she or she has to, yeah, she has, she has to." Business model innovation, right, or um, uh, proper purpose, or some woke theme, you know, activism, activism, yeah, okay, okay. And then they jump on that bandwagon, so it, it becomes. It becomes a bandwagon-driven thing. I think, I think, I think you will agree. We see a lot of bandwagons in management research, right? Oh yeah. Everyone is like lemmings. They are, you know, migrating to a certain uh, theme, and uh, and working on that. Or they, they they embrace, you know, the the esoteric or crazy stuff. So we have this, for example, something called critical management study, studies. Yes. Uh, so we talked about epistemology earlier, right? And um, yeah, or they or they embrace really radical activist agendas and forget about being scholars. Uh, and we, we and in 2020 and, you know, 2021, I think we saw a lot of that. Uh, but it's it seems to be dying out again because people realize that this kind of unconditional radical activism is just at odds with being a scholar. I mean, you could be attentive to social needs and so on and work with stakeholders, but... Yes, yeah, critique in and of itself that doesn't generate new findings. I mean, in the long run, uh, as diminishing returns, that there's no doubt about that. Yeah, so that was theory, but there's also empirics. And um, I mean, you, you've been a consultant and, and, and so on. And so you've seen, you, you've seen firsthand how management frameworks get translated into consulting practice. And some of some of the the problems with that because when when we do management the reason we want to do management research in addition to finding out new things is of course to offer useful tools for managers so levers they can pull basically to make their companies and hopefully also the world a better place but you can only you, you can only do this if you have causal knowledge and of course, all theory in management is per definition, it's causal. But the problem, as, as you know, much of the our empiricism still isn't isn't really causal. Yeah. Uh, and I think there's a lot to do there still. So this, you know, the 
identification revolutions. This began very much in, in economics and has spread to management. It is very, it's a very serious agenda. Actually. I, f- I feel I lack a substantial part of knowledge on this. When you say em- empirics is not causal, is because the statistics we use, the analytical yeah, tools yeah. we use yeah, are the, not up the to data the data statistics are in a sense, not causal. We, so we look at, at, at correlations and, and so on, right? It's about being able to, to show that A actually caused B. Mm, okay. So, so these, this is the, uh, um, speak, speaking causally about the effect, if you like. You know, uh, approximating, it's a little bit unprecise, but we used, we used to say that, or we like to say that the experimental approach Randomized controlled trials and so on, and that's that's a gold standard, right? And that's we we can try to approximate that in management. It's it's difficult because many things cannot easily be subjected to to, to lab or field experiments, and many issues to do with um, strategy cannot easily. Or the things you are you are interested in, like foresight and, and scenarios and all that, and super difficult to empirically examine that using these kind of approaches, right? Inherently. But a lot of things have to do with, say, rewards and HR and, you know, the kind of things that people who work on psychology and management, they can, they, they, they take up with. This can be subjected to this kind of, let's say, empirical discipline, right? And we, and we need more of that. So you would, you would certainly favor gold standard randomized trial experiments over cross-sectional regression analysis. I would uh, favor it over much of the, uh, the kind of empirical work that sort of occupied our journals like 10, 15 years. They, they, were, they, were, they were printed in our journals 10, 15, 20 years ago. Okay. You know, it's correlational stuff with no attention to causality. I see. I I cannot say much of this problem, with, which you just brought up to the table, which is very interesting. But what I'm sure about is the over-theorization is, is a huge problem that if you ask any if you ask any management scholar, they would agree it exists. Yeah. But the real problem is when we have to sit down and, and start to think about a solution, there's absolutely no way we're able to do that because it's a collective problem and nobody yes. is willing to take up responsibility and say, okay, let's rewrite the whole uh, system. Who's going to yeah. do that, right? Even, even the top schools are not doing that. So that's the, that's the impasse we're, we're at right now. Yes, yes. So we have created the system where where everything is based on producing new theory. I mean, because you when you produce new theory, good theory, and you have typically empirics to back it up, you get published in those eight class journals, and then you mm. get tenure and you you have a career and so on, right? And um, the, the the whole thing, the whole field has become basically a a competition, at least in the upper, let's say the upper echelons or upper parts of the, the, the field have become a, one big, almost rent seeking competition for, yeah. you know, placing your papers in the, the five best journals and uh, thereby securing your career. And of course, in a sense, that's part of professionalization and, and so on. And, and uh, in some ways, it has been a very productive exercise. I mean, where, where I, I've been in in this since 1989 wow that's that's more than three decades right yeah and i let me tell you the if you look at the european business schools in the 1990s mm. and, and where we are today it it's a huge it's one huge one big pro- story of pro- progress basically yeah but there, there may be limits to how far we want to go in terms of pushing this theory theory first theory always agenda but I, I, that's actually one thing, if I may mention, I, I realize we don't have much time. Yet, but since since you are, this is something that I know that you're interested in. One, one thing where I actually think that we need new theory or serious thinking is actually radical uncertainty. Yes. And it, it, I've been thinking about this because I've been asked to organize a session for a big conference next year. And and it's, it's, I, I surveyed a number of publications in management research on radical uncertainty, and it just seems to me that very, very few prominent management scholars have thought seriously about radical uncertainty and what it, what it is, what it means, what are its implications, how we adapt to it, how we try to what do we do identify in it? Yeah. sources of, uh, of uncertainty. So, yeah, I'm actually I'm starting to... Um, I'm getting interested in scenarios and 
on both sides. Oh, then we have we have to talk and have another episode on this. <laughs> oh sure, I'm I'm game. So as our time together is approaching the end, I usually like to ask a more lighthearted question uh, at the end when uh, our minds are a bit more tired. So I know that you have spent some time in Italy as a business school professor. And as an Italian, I have some curiosity to ask you about your experience. But this question is not exclusively about my curiosity, because as you pointed out correctly a few weeks ago in one of your LinkedIn posts, Italy, and in particular, a couple of schools in Italy are slowly, actually, maybe not so slowly, going up in the ranks. So Italy is starting to become a very interesting location to be as a business school uh, opinion leader. So I'm very interested to learn in a couple of minutes, in the last few minutes, what is your experience about the Italian landscape from an outsider perspective? Yeah, so I was, um, for almost four years, I was a professor at Bocconi University in Milano. I was the uh, Carlo de Benedetti Professor of Entrepreneurship. So I had a, a nice chair professor, professorship there. And, you know, I, I think the, of these years, that's probably the best, my best years professionally ever. Oh, wow. The school is extremely well organized and, and wow. led, uh, and uh, I have fantastic colleagues. And uh, I thought you were gonna say because of red wine and and pasta, but the most beautiful country in the world and all that. Okay. Uh, and it's absolutely true. So uh, it was it was it was it was, it was absolutely am am amazing. Uh, the problem with your question is that with answering your question yeah. is that when you are professor at Bocconi, you are in a sense you are an outlier. Because Bocconi is it is part of the Italian university system, but it's as you know uh, probably it's a it's a private university. So it, it un, unlike the other um, most of the other schools and universities, and there's also Louis in Rome, which is also uh, right. private, of course. But Bocconi is an outlier in in, in terms of its uh, financing model. Uh, so it's also based on student fees to a large extent, unlike the other universities. Uh, uh, and also, I have to say, because it, it stands out academically, it's it's very very strong, right? Yeah, it is. So it's like a number uh, in terms of research rankings, number three or four in Europe, I guess. Yeah, so it's it, very high now. Yeah, yeah. and the LPS about it, uh, and it's very impressive. And it has really, you know, sometimes people, university administrators, sometimes imply that it's super difficult to change your position in the business school landscape. And this may be, but you know, it 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 it, it is doable, and Bocconi really showed that it is doable because, like twenty years ago, it was, it was it was it was probably respected in Italy, and probably had good position there two two three decades ago, but it wasn't it didn't have much clout internationally. Right, that's right, that's right. So they in most all all the big big shots in, in management, they certainly know about management. Yeah, know that's about great. And, and it is great. So that makes it a little bit difficult for me to to evaluate the, as you said, the I think you said the landscape or something about. So in a way, if you take Bocconi out of the equation, yeah, exactly. That that there's certainly very good places in uh, in, in in Italy also. Uh, there, I mentioned Louis. There's also uh, Bologna and, and other places. But... Yeah, that's where I got my bachelor degree. Oh yeah, okay. In Bologna, the Torino also, Torino uh, also. probably getting some important. Uh, Lugano, uh, I guess. Uh, but what do you attribute their growth? I'm I'm curious. What do you attribute their growth to? But perhaps there is something that can be repeated. I'm I'm curious. Strategy and hierarchy and managerial authority. That's a great way to finish. Know, I'm, this serious, I'm serious. So the, my understanding of what happened, like almost 20 years ago, is that there was a coalition of far-sighted professor, professors who were really in contact with the international environment. Okay. And just said, well, let's form a coalition for the purpose of changing the institution that we serve, mm. right? And they uh, they they did this, and they did it by by uh, bringing in um, a very well respected Italian economist from Harvard, placing him as as rector, and by placing really top people in the top as president. I'm not sure Monty was actually the president at the beginning, but perhaps he okay. was. But as you as you know, uh, Monty was. Was was the president for a very long time, and that of course that gives you a lot of power, right? Yeah. Uh, both so he was you know EU commissioner, prime minister, and whatnot, right? So that gives you a lot of extremely useful outside connections, but it also works internally, right? Because yeah. 
then you, if you have a change agenda, and you have these respected powers, it motivates. It, it it motivates, but it also literally gives you the power to change things. And I think they the first one of the first deans was I think a former or or perhaps it just helped with re redesigning the organization. But this was a former dean of Insat, mm. uh, who's I've forgotten his name. But of course he he had he was used to working in a very international environment, right? Because Insat isn't a French business school; it's a completely international business school. So he he knew what would be required to to make it to the next level, and help people help, help Bocconi redesign incentive systems and you know criteria for promotion and and so on. So it is doable, but it requires that you have some kind of strong a, a strong dominant internal coalition okay. because that's I, I, as I understand this is how it began at Bocconi. Yeah, I love how the whole conversation circled back on uh, our starting point the importance right. of hierarchy well i thank you for your time i really love this conversation i think there were a lot of uh, super interesting insights so thanks so much nikolai for your time i really appreciated it and i wish you all the best with your work thanks a lot it was a pleasure